thanks very much again for, for our, I don't know, fifth or sixth or something, Curlew Action webinar. And the idea behind tonight is to give a general overview of the complexities of the uplands. So we're not concentrating on any one specific topic and going into the sort of nitty gritty of that. What, what I want out of this one is for us all to get a feel for just how complicated trying to understand the issues facing the uplands are. And if there are issues in the uplands, there are issues for curlews. So looking at the world, if you like, through curly eyes is really useful because um, so many things affect them. And what happens in the uplands, which is where we'll hear in a minute, is their heartland populations. It's absolutely vital for the future of curlews that we understand and can tackle sensitively all the big issues that they're facing. Uh, so with that in mind, um, we have assembled a great panel. And um, those of you who have joined us before will be familiar with Russell Wynn. Russ and I, Professor Russell Wynn, I should say. Russ and I work very closely together with the Curly Recovery Partnership. I am the chair and Russ is the manager. And uh, Russ is also uh, managing a lot of or involved very heavily in a lot of the conservation issues in the New Forest. Um, Russ and I have worked really hard on trying to get to grips with the big issues facing curlews right across England and of course um, in, in the curlew action sense we'll be looking at um, the whole of the, of the United Kingdom as well. Um, so we will, so Russ will give the Curlew Recovery Partnership the sort of roundtable of organisations representing curlew recovery, we'll give our stance on how we see the importance of the uplands to curlew conservation. We also have uh, Lee Hesseltine, and Lee is an upland farmer in the Yorkshire Dales, um, in probably one of the most beautiful farms in the country. Uh, you live in the most glorious place, Lee. Um, it's a mixed farm of sheep and cattle, and um, but it, she and her husband, Neil, farm very much with nature in mind. Um, and try to get that balance right between making a living as upland farmers, but also being sensitive to the nature that they feel responsible for. And uh, we have filmed in Neil's, in sorry, in Lee's and Neil's farm earlier this year. We went and filmed curlews um, on their land, and I know just from being with them just how much the curlews mean to you and um, what you're trying to do to set an example, if you like, for upland farming. We also have with us, um, if anybody who does much Twitter will and, and follows Matt Cross, you'll know is one of the most amusing people. You do, you are meant to be amusing on Twitter, aren't you? Matt, it's not. That is the general plan, yes. <laughs> and Matt is uh, shooting times. Um, are you the, uh, you're, you're a freelance journalist, mainly on shooting issues. Uh, I am. Yeah, I do a lot of work for Shooting Times, but technically I don't work for them because they don't want to yes. contribute to it. Yeah, you're a freelance journalist. So uh, Matt will talk to us about the issues to do with and, and the, the benefits of shooting in the uplands um, and how important that location is um, in terms of, of that as a sport and, and how curlews fit into that very complicated and sometimes controversial activity. And we also have Owen. Owen, can you actually speak to us at all? Can you hear me? Yes, hooray, we can hear you, Owen. We can't uh, see you, but we can hear you. For some reason, it, it won't let me join with a video, um, but I'm happy enough to proceed without you being able to see me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, that's great. Well, I'm delighted that we can hear you anyway. Um, Owen Dalton. Owen is somebody who has lived and breathed rewilding, um, in his case, in Ireland, but the principles are, apply right across the board. Um, you recently just published a book, uh, Owen, called the Irish Rainforest. It's yeah. called An Irish Atlantic Rainforest, A Personal Irish. Journey into the Magic of Rewilding. There you go. And um, I know it's been incredibly well received. I haven't actually got my copy yet. So Owen is going to present to us the, uh, the benefits of rewilding and what that could mean in the future um, for some of these most beautiful and wild places that we have left. Okay, so I will just start then with a bit of an overview. Uh, the uplands across the UK are about 40% of the land um, and they hold and supply about 70% of our water across the UK. 
and that over half are SSS designated as an SSSI. Um, they are where the three R's uh, are going to take place, which is the uh, rewilding, renewables, and um, re. Oh, the other one? Rewildings, renewables, and uh, reintroductions. And that's of, of, of species. Those are the three R's which are, we tend to want to think of as happening in the uplands. It's where a lot of forestry takes place. It's where a lot of we have a, a, a you know, quite a, a, a substantial amount of our sheep and, and beef farming. Um, it's where we want to put wind farms. It's where we like to go walking. It's where we like to think of as being wild. But it's a very much a working landscape as well. So it is a. A very important area. It's a large landmass, particularly Scotland and Northern England and parts of Wales, which is where most of our uplands are. Um, and by uplands, I'm measuring that above 600 metres. So 600 feet, not 600 metres, that'd be quite impressive. So it's about above 600 feet is, is where we have, a, is a definition sort of of the uplands. So no doubt the uplands are important to us. It is where we have most of the curlews and this curlew action. That's an area we're obviously really interested in. And so I'm going to hand over to Russell Wynne to do a short presentation on just how important the uplands are to curlews. Thank you, Mary. Uh, so let's see if we can get the screen sharing working. So open share tray. Right now, how's that looking? Good. And if I go to that, is that a full screen version? That is now. Yeah. Brilliant. Good. OK, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Russell Wynn. As Mary said, I'm down here in the, the New Forest National Park, but currently uh, Curly Recovery Partnership Manager. Part of the reason for putting this slide up was just to say those of you not familiar with the Curly Recovery Partnership, uh, there's the logos of all of our steering group members. And, uh, and pictures of Mary and I gurning at you. Uh, but really just to say that I will be coming to the end of my, my two years uh, in the post as CRP manager in February, which has been brilliant. Uh, as Mary's here, to say it's been a particular pleasure to work with, with Mary, um, who really is a, a force of nature uh, for conservation. And that's been, uh, been, been absolutely brilliant. But so I'm gonna be handing over to someone else in February and we are now advertising as to who that person is gonna be we've even upgraded the job title to director. So um, so if you're interested, uh, I'll put up a email address later and I can ping you. Those of you already in the Curly Recovery Partnership Network will have seen my uh, message today on this. All right, Curly in the Upland. So the international context for this, and I should say that Sam Franks from BTO was due to give this um, introduction and would have done a much better job than, than I could, but I'll, I'll do my best. But Sam and BTO were involved in contributing to this European uh, Breeding Bird Atlas, the second edition, which came out recently. Fabulous bit of work. And this is the uh, Eurasian curlew uh, model breeding distribution for Europe. And basically, the darker the green, the more curlews there are. And what this shows is that at the scale of Europe, uh, the uplands of England in particular, but also some areas of, of Scotland, they really come out with those dark green colours as one of three hotspots. The others are in Finland, particularly central Finland, and the other, perhaps surprisingly, uh, is in the uh, northern part of the Netherlands and in uh, northwest Germany. And it's quite interesting because we have a particular view of what habitat curlew is like. And if you look at the images I just dragged off of Google uh, Google Maps, the satellite view, so you look at the Yorkshire Dales, uh, the sort of terrain that uh, Lee will be familiar with in terms of farming and the sorts of uh, driven grouse more, the sort of pockmark appearance where there's been heather burning taking place to support driven grouse shooting that Matt will be familiar with. That's the kind of habitat that many of our curlews in England like to occupy. So the moorland and the moorland fringe and the farmland in by type habitat. If you look at the Netherlands, I mean, it's a total uh, intensive agricultural terrain, and it's very likely that the curlews in this area are in somewhat of a relict situation where the intensification of agriculture all around them is, is really causing some issues to the population. But they're still there in quite a high density as they're a long lived bird. Um, but one wonders whether they can hang on in that kind of very intensively farmed uh, lowland landscape. And then in Finland, uh, the bottom right image, the areas uh, where they seem to thrive are often quite heterogeneous with quite a lot of forest, which again is sort of contrary to what we think about in this country of, of what Curly's like. We generally think of them as liking big open expanses. 
in Finland, they seem to be able to cope quite well with fragmented landscapes, bit of forest, bit of farming, bit of bog, but they've got a very different predator guild to us. They've still got things like brown bears and wolverines and, and eagle owls and stuff in Finland that, that we don't have. So we've got a lot of meso middle predators here, like foxes and crows and things, but we're lacking those those top predators. So so the lack of those uh, uh, overabundant meso predators is probably why curly do a bit better close to forested areas in Finland than they do in this this country. And then we've also had them reported on golf courses breeding quite successfully uh, and on horse gallops as well. So in this country and in other countries, we maybe need to think about curlew as being a bit more adaptable to where they breed uh, than, than maybe we first thought. If we look at the map from the BTO uh, Breeding Atlas for the UK and Ireland, uh, the last one, these are over 10 years old now, but the breeding relative abundance map on the left, that really shows that that thick wadge of red uh, highlighted on the uh, the sort of Pennine chain uh, with other areas in Northern England and Scotland in particular also quite quite important. But that highest abundance in the Pennines um, that comes out really really nicely. Um, south of the Black Line on that map, there's few as as few as two thousand pairs. Um, so the overall UK population of fifty eight and a half thousand pairs is very much focused in the northern half. Uh, and very much focused on the uplands and that's about a quarter of the global population in the uplands uh, in the UK. About half of those breeding in England, uh, max about 25,000 pairs we think because the population has declined since the last um, atlas um, and I say over 90% of those in the Pennine chain. I think one of the things that's significant to think about tonight is that individual upland landowners, some of the larger estates, can hold 1% or more of England's breeding curlew, so something in the region of 250 um, breeding pairs. So a single landowner can have 1% or more of England's breeding curlews, and we hold about a quarter of the world population. So that's just, just something to think about. The UK breeding population is not in good shape. It's, it's halved over the last couple of decades with productivity a key um, a key issue. And, and I've said this before, and I say it again, the work from Graham Appleton coming up with a figure of uh, needing 10,000 more curlew chicks per year to get to fledging in the UK to just break even and stabilise the population is, is what we need to keep in mind. We need national scale action that's only going to be delivered through national scale policy uh, to really turn it around for curlews in this, this country. Sam can be with us this evening, but I just wanted to flash this up. This was a paper that she led with colleagues from the BTO and the RSPV. And if you, if you just look at the red box there, I'll just read it out if, if people can't see the screen. The conclusion of this paper, which looked at the a sort of national scale analysis of the potential drivers of, of curlew decline in this country, uh, their conclusion said, we found support for the negative effects of intensive agriculture, forestry, increases in generalist predator populations and climate warming on curlew abundance and population change. And they suggested that effective site protection and measures to reduce generalist predator abundance may be important conservation measures together with improving breeding habitat quality in the wider countryside. So that really nicely paraphrases a lot of the, the, the current issues that curlews are facing in this country. And one of the biggies that, that the CRP are interested in and we're engaging with, with Forestry England and Natural England and others with at the moment is forestry. And obviously we've got some really significant tree planting and, and forest expansion targets in this country to, to help mitigate climate change and to make sure that we continue to get access to commercial timber. So BTO have led a lot of really good work producing zonal maps, again largely based on data from the last atlas, but with some updated uh, sort of trial data from a couple of areas, Northumberland and, and North East Cumbria, um, to guide the uh, applicants who are wanting to plant trees on their land, particularly in the uplands, uh, and make sure that the areas with the highest density of breeding waders, so not just curlew, but things like golden plover and, and red shank and snipe and lapwing, uh, are not going to be um, heavily impacted. So, so these zonal maps really pick out the core highest densities areas. This map here shows curlew and the red shows the highest density uh, and, and the inference being that those areas an applicant wouldn't get permission to put lots of trees on the land because it would have a negative impact on those those waders. So if people are interested, if you go, if you just search DEFRA, forestry, whatever in Google, you can eventually find your way to this Forestry Commission browser where for every 
uh, grid square, uh, plummeter grid square in the country, you can click on it and it will come up with a, a modelled abundance for the different types of, of waders. So this is really to guide landowners in their um, application process and to screen out ones at an early stage where it's just not going to be feasible because the impacts on breeding waders would be would be too great. Uh, onshore wind, uh, I think this was from a talk I did uh, a few months ago. So Boris Johnson, I mean, we've had two prime ministers since then and quite a lot of water under the bridge. Um, but nevertheless, I think the current administration's view on onshore wind is still rather negative, but we'll wait and see what happens in future. But onshore wind is an issue uh, in, in upland areas for um, species like the curlew. And and I've put this one in about the new forest just to remind me to talk about recreation, which uh, you know we think of it sometimes as being a lowland focused thing in areas like Dartmoor and where I am in the new forest. But recreational pressure in the uplands in areas like the Peak District and elsewhere can be very significant uh, with issue, issues such as dogs off the lead and and, and other disturbances uh, potentially causing impacts to the to the birds. Um, this was a really interesting contribution from Natural England that was published in uh, the journal IBIS. Uh, I think it was earlier this year, uh, and I'll just pick out the text in italics there. So they were looking at land use options in the British uplands, and I say it was a very interesting contribution from a body such as Natural England. Uh, so recent events and an increased understanding of topics such as carbon storage and emissions demonstrate that the view that the uplands are only of value to those with an interest in sheep, forestry or grouse is past its time. Our view is that if driven grouse shooting was to cease or decline in extent, rather than the default land use being conversion to or intensification of sheep pasture or plantation forestry, it is more likely that a range of alternative land uses would take place in response to the biophysical and regulatory constraints applying on moorland. Uh, discuss. Uh, I think from a CRP perspective, we've uh, really put quite a lot of effort into bringing different practitioners together to talk about upland conservation of curlews because we see the value that all of them bring to the table uh, from their different perspectives. And I think Rob Foster, uh, and a, who hosted this meeting at Abbeystead Estate in Boland, uh, and, a, and a couple of the attendees, this was a training workshop hosted by the CRP to bring people together to talk about best practice in curly survey monitoring. And you'll just see there from the annotated labels, uh, apologies if these aren't all 100% accurate, but I think they are, um, showing the really widespread of representatives of different bodies and interest groups all coming together really to share uh, expertise and experience uh, around curly conservation, which is is great. Uh, if anyone wants to contact me about any of the stuff I've discussed, but particularly if you're interested in the new director role, um, please drop me an email. The email address is there and the curly recovery um, website is uh, there as well. OK, I will stop presenting and that should be back to you, Mary. Yeah, thank you ever so much, Russ. That was a really good overview of the uplands, the, their absolutely vital uh, role in conserving curlews in this country, and in fact, the Eurasian curlew right across Europe, um, and the fact that we have this very special habitat, but it's a very desired habitat, a, a very useful habitat for many different sorts of activities. And so thank you, Russ, that was a really excellent outline of what's going on. I'm now going to go over to Lee. And as I said at the beginning, and for those of you who've joined, Lee is and her husband, Neil, are upland farmers in the Yorkshire Dales. Uh, truly beautiful farm uh, in Malham Cove, right by Malham Cove. And um, Neil and Lee farm their land in sympathy with the natural world. They have particularly love of curlew, so we've been in touch with them over that. But it's not an easy space to occupy. It's a cultural landscape as well as a wild landscape. Um, and it is not easy to make a living at the moment in the uplands if you love nature as well. So over to you, uh, Lee, or you might disagree with what I've just said and let <laughs> us know what you think about farming in the uplands. Thanks a lot, Mary. And thanks for the lovely introduction at the beginning. Um, I think Ellen's got some nice photographs to share on my behalf. Um, it's just a very basic slideshow of pictures that really, really illustrate who we are and what we do. I thought it was much better than you all looking at my face. But um, yeah, thank you. I'm Lee from Hilltop Farm in Malham in the Yorkshire Dales. Um, Hilltop Farm, I'm originally from Walls End, a town just outside of Newcastle in the northeast. Um, so I'm a fairly new entrant to farming after the last 20 years. Um, Neil's family have farmed here for generations and Neil took the farm on when I met him about 20 years ago 
So this is something very much that we've moved forward um, in our own right. Just this is a quick whistle stop tour of the farm, really. Um, we're lucky enough to have ground nesting birds on the farm, including curlews, but other waders too. Um, all sort of red shank, plover, a few lapwing, uh, snipe, also skylarks. Um, so it's great to have those. Um, so just to explain a little about, about the management we do and the farm, it's an upland farm consisting of permanent pasture. Um, categorised as severely disadvantaged, the majority above the moorland line. And Mary said earlier that uh, we're categorising it here as anything over 600 feet. Our farm ranges from 800 feet right up to 1800 feet. Um, so a huge difference there um, and a huge range in terms of impact of the weather as well. Um, limestone grassland is a very special habitat. There's not much of it in the UK or globally. Um, and it's really important to conserve and protect it. There's some very special species that just exist in limestone grassland. Um, we also have hay meadows, which are managed traditionally. Um, and by that, I mean, we have very late cutting dates historically in the Dales. Cutting dates would be late just because of the constraints, not huge machinery, things like that. Um, so late cutting dates and some of those meadows have been taken from previously improved with fertiliser, that sort of thing, to back to um, restored meadowland where it's been um, restored using green hay. In the past, I think I have to be honest and say the farm didn't always look like this. Um, I won't dwell too much on that just because of the constraints of time, but it's fair to say there was a lot of pressure on the land. Um, due to us having too many sheep, about 800 sheep at that time. It led to a serious amount of overgrazing, a reliance on grain-based imported feed for sheep and huge amounts of labour on Neil's part. None of that was sustainable environmentally, financially or mentally for us. Um, I'm very happy to say now things have changed to where you see on the photographs, what you see in the photographs. We run a large herd of native belted Galloway cattle and a very small flock of Swaledale hill sheep with a few Wensleydale sheep too. We're very much in favour of native breeds. Um, the right animal in the right place is, is just a perfect fit for our farm. All, our, all of our animals are outwintered all year and they do an amazing job in terms of conservation grazing. So what they do is they take out rank, thick grasses over the winter, allowing all of our botanical herbs, flowers, grasses, sedges to come through in the spring. Um, taking the pressure away from the land has really allowed the land to go through its natural cycles of rest and recovery and growth. Uh, we have a longer sward throughout the farm now, um, nothing too short, which means longer roots holding more water in the land. Um, so, yeah, we we can hold the water more, uh, which is great for waders, but also great because it prevents flooding in some way. The animals themselves are free to roam. They're able to exhibit their natural flock and herd behaviours and taking the pressure away has reduced or taken away completely any routine need for medication or wormers. And obviously wormers have an impact on the land um, through insects, invertebrates, that sort of thing, all the things our nesting birds eat. I think it's really important to say that farming with nature has made us more profitable. It's made both our sheep and cattle enterprises more profitable. I would be lying if I said in their own right, we could live without the stewardship funds that we gain through being in high level stewardship. Um, but being compensated for the nature work we do is an amazing privilege. Um, we can produce pasture fed meat alongside na nature and climate recovery um, and seeing the farm become a diverse ecosystem has made us question even more what else we can do in the future. Um, it's made the farm more resilient to weather changes, extreme weather events, uh, droughts, rainfall, that sort of thing, but also economically more resilient because we just don't rely on the inputs. Uh, anymore. I became an ambassador for Curlew Action a couple of years ago, three years ago, um, just because we're so lucky to have the birds on the farm and any time spent with them 
lots of people watching here will know that as soon as you know them, it's really impossible not to be bothered that they're in such trouble. Um, and hearing Mary Caldwell banging the drum over years was impossible for me to ignore, so I just had to do it. So I'm sure we'll have a great discussion tonight and find out more, and I'm really pleased to be a part of it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lee. That was very nice of you to say. And, um, and thank you for showing us the pictures of the farm as well, just to show what farming with nature can actually look like. And, and we were up there, as I said earlier, um, in uh, April. I can't remember, was it April, May? May, May, May time. May? Yeah, and it really was the most beautiful, beautiful place to be. Um, but as Lee says, um, it's not always plain sailing. It's not always that easy. It's a challenging landscape and it's very much a cultural landscape. And not everybody, I think it would be fair to say, Lee, uh, wants to do what you want to do round and about. And maybe we can talk a little bit about that, how you overcome these these traditional attitudes to the land uh, and where change can feel very um, difficult to accept. So thank you for that great introduction. Now over, I think, to Matt, uh, Matt Cross. Matt Cross is a journalist, a, sh a shooting journalist, understands the world of shooting very well. You've written on all sorts of things, Matt, and, and across the sort of world of shooting from the lowlands to the uplands. Um, and uh, that is a cultural activity. That's a traditional activity in the uplands as well. So uh, could you just give everybody a, a brief overview of, of who you are and, and what you do and some of the challenges and issues and benefits that you can see from your perspective? OK. Um, thank you very much, Mary. Mary, can you hear me? Because I know I've had some tech troubles tonight. Yeah, can hear me. we can hear you. Yeah. Um, so good evening, everybody. Um, as Mary said, my name is Matt Cross. Um, my daily bread is earned doing what used to be the news editor's job at Shooting Times. Um, so I, I write on a very regular basis for Shooting Times, um, writing news for them and writing features for them. Um, what I'd say at the outset of this is I, I, I completely understand that some people find shooting recreational game bird shooting fundamentally morally objectionable. I get that. Um, you know, I, obviously doing what I do, I disagree, but I, I acknowledge that, that, that that's there. Uh, and I acknowledge that people have well-reasoned, sensible, you know, reasons to hold that view. Um, I suppose where where the where the issue becomes difficult um, for a lot of people, I suppose, is that we can, I think, demonstrate quite well that whatever you think on the ethics of shooting, shooting can be a, a great friend um, to certain bird species, particularly. Um, and and curlews are very much one of those. Um, we know that that grouse moors can be wonderful places for curlews. Now, I acknowledge, I completely acknowledge that they are not wonderful places for stoats or or weasels or at times hen harriers. I acknowledge that, um, and that is why we have a difficulty in dealing with these issues. Um, but the reality is that grouse keepers know better than anybody else in the world how to make sure that ground nesting birds have lots of chicks and that those chicks fledge. Um, they have a, a wealth of knowledge and experience and equipment and everything that is necessary to make that happen. Um, and they do. Um, shooting really over the last, let me think, five years, I would say, I would say over the last five years, has really embraced waders. Um, and it's become a big part of, of shooting culture to think of shooting estates and gamekeepers as almost custodians of those birds. Now, there's always been that tendency in shooting, but I just think it's become much more mainstream in recent years um, to to think of part of the role of shooting as being that we are the guys who who look after the curlews and the oyster catchers and the lapwings um, and the golden plover and and those kind of um, ground nesting birds. Um, I, I'm again, I'm well aware that there are many people who say, well, you know, that's a flag of convenience, and actually, that's not what you're really interested in. What you're really interested in is shooting. I'm sure for some shoots that's true. For others, I'm sure it's not. Um, there are many shoots that that genuinely, deeply care about their their non-game bird ground nesters, um, and they want to do the best of them. Either way, I, I'd say that I don't think the curlews mind. Um, I think the curlews just don't want to get eaten by foxes. So I, I don't think they mind what the underlying motivation of that is. But what we do know is that that grouse grouse shooting particularly works very well for waders. Um, 
the, the other thing I think that, that's really important and where I will take take issue with one of the, the papers that Russell brought forward is I'm sure he'd expect me to do it. Um, so Russell uh, mentioned a paper that looked at potential alternative land uses in the uplands um, and suggested that, you know, a, a move away from grouse shooting wouldn't necessarily be a move towards forestry or intensive, intensified farming. That's certainly not my experience. Um, I, I live in the southwest of Scotland in on the border between Ayrshire and Galloway. Um, and this historically was a grouse shooting sheep farming area. Um, a few years ago, I was given the, the game books for an estate that used to be here. It's long split up now. Um, and they recorded all, all manner of different species of shot here. Obviously, a lot of grouse, a lot of black grouse. Um, but if you, can, if you actually look at those areas now, they are now commercial forestry. Uh, and they are commercial forestry of the dankest and most miserable type. Um, so my, my own experience, and I'd say the experience of this community, is that one of the really valuable roles of shooting is that shooting holds at bay what I would say are much more exploitative and damaging land uses. Um, and particularly in the southwest of Scotland, it, it holds at bay commercial afforestation. Um, so I, I think it is, it's, it's valuable, it's important. It puts a really highly skilled, well-trained predator control workforce into the countryside, um, which we know is beneficial, done right, is beneficial to curlews. You know, the, the guy who just pops a few foxes every now and then probably isn't doing much good for anything, but concerted, well-organized predator control, we know um, is beneficial to curlews. And that's, that's one of the things that shooting can deliver. Um, in our countryside. Um, again, I would acknowledge, as, as Patrick um, Galbraith, who's the editor of Shooting Times, and I think Patrick Laurie, who, who's a regular writer for Shooting Times, both did in the, in the previous um, webinar, that it, shooting can also create problems. Uh, it can create problems for ground nesting birds. Um, there, there is some evidence, I'm not sure how strong that evidence is, but there is evidence that large scale game bird releasing can actually increase predator abundance. There's a phenomenon, I had a wonderful term for it um, in shooting. Of, of, and it was a very senior gamekeeper used this term. So if there's any gamekeepers listening to this and they get offended, you're getting offended with the wrong person, right? But they, they talked about um, what, what they called the wheat donkey phenomenon, which is where gamekeepers, instead of doing the traditional wide set of roles of a gamekeeper, which would involve habitat management and predator control and all those things, essentially their job was to shift bags of wheat around, put lots of birds down, shift bags of wheat around to feed those birds. Um, where shooting is conducted in that way, it is probably a net negative for ground nesting birds and for biodiversity more, more generally. But when it's conducted well, then I have little doubt that it is a net positive, particularly for ground nesting birds and overall for biodiversity. So that's where I am at with this. I think, um, you know, I acknowledge, I acknowledge that people have their fundamental moral objections. I certainly acknowledge that there's bad practice in the shooting sector, no doubt about that. And anybody who knows who knows me and kind of what, what I think about shooting, what I write about shooting, what I talk about shooting, will know that I'm quite open in acknowledging that, that there is and there has been bad practice in the shooting sector. But at the same time, I think it can deliver a great many benefits um, and it can hold at bay some much more damaged and exploitative land uses. Thank you very much, Matt. Um, really appreciate your openness and your willingness to talk and your um, always admired very much your ability to to present the the issues with good humour and uh, with respect for everybody. And I think that's what Curlew Action is absolutely about. Um, we want to have these discussions. We want to have them openly and we want to have them respectfully. And uh, you can disagree with someone and not be um, abusive towards them. And I think uh, hopefully we'll see more and more of a shift to this much more open discussion about the very many different sorts of people that live in this country and the many different sorts of activities we undergo. And we look honestly at the costs and benefits. Uh, and I think that's, that's where we want to be. And I think hopefully that's where the discussions will go in the future. So thank you, Matt. And that was very interesting. Um, and then finally, our, our pictureless but uh, wonderful contributor, Owen Dalton. Uh, Owen, you're still there. You haven't disappeared into the ether since we've I been hope there. I am. Can you hear me? Yeah, excellent. So <laughs> for those of you who joined late, 
Owen is a rewilding expert. He lives and breathes rewilding for 15 years. He's rewilded his patch of Ireland. He knows the issues. He understands the pros and cons, what this means, uh, what, what the consequences are and what can happen if we rewild. And so over to you, Owen, I think, to give us your version of what you mean. It's To me, rewilding is such an elastic term. I never quite know what it means. Um, I can't kind of get a feeling for it, but I think everybody who probably answers that question has a slightly different take on it. So over to you, I think, to just for you to tell us what you mean by rewilding and what you think the relationship is between re rewilding and ground nesting birds like curlews. Thanks very much, Mary, and thanks to everybody else for your really interesting um, presentations and talks. Uh, really fascinating. Um, so yeah, I, I've been, uh, as Mary said, I've been um, part rewilding my farm and part high nature value farming for the last 14 years. I have a small herd of Dexter cattle. Um, I, think it's, I think it's true that there's a lot of uh, elasticity, as Mary says, in, in how people define rewilding, but I think most people who who um, are advocates of rewilding would agree that it's essentially um, an approach that uh, instead of trying to manage land um, intensively and to manage habitats and wild species as more traditional forms of conservation have sought to do, it's more about re-equilibrating uh, ecosystems in such a way that they move closer to being able to regulate themselves. And um, if we think about it, um, in if we if we zoom out in in a in in a time in a temporal sense, uh, it's it's very plain that nature managed perfectly well to manage itself. Uh, for hundreds of millions of years before people came along and said, well, we have to put uh, native breeds of cattle in here to do this, and we have to shoot those to do that, and we have to, we have to do, do this, that, and the other, and tweak, the, tweak habitats this way and that way, and, and have continual human intervention. Uh, for hundreds of millions of years, nature got on perfectly well without any of that. In fact, the problems for nature really came a lot, began, if we're perfectly honest, when people arrived and started managing landscapes. So that would be the essential backdrop to a rewilder's perspective on all of these, um, all of these debates. And a, a really good example of that would be uh, the discussion of uh, mesopredator management, like foxes or whatever, through shooting or whatever else. Um, I mean, we have to ask ourselves for a start: why are why are fox po populations so so high? I mean, I've I've been told I have heard now. I don't have any you know documentary evidence for this, but I've heard that fox populations are estimated to be around 20 times higher in Ireland now I'm speaking than what they would naturally be um, in, you know, before people started farming and so on. And the reason why, there's, there's a range of reasons why fox populations are so unnaturally high. Um, but it all it, it all boils down to total dysfunction, ecological dysfunction within the landscape. So you've got a, a range of factors. The first thing is that you know meso predator release is a well known effect of removing larger predators from the landscape, as we have done everywhere throughout the UK and Ireland. So we've gotten rid of lynx, wolves, bears. Uh, everything that would naturally control and and large uh, and certainly in Ireland, you know, most of the large um, flying predators have been extinct for a long time. Now, some of them have been reintroduced, like white-tailed eagles and and golden eagles. But that that 
they they haven't been around for long and their numbers are limited. So um, on top of meso predator release as a result of a lack of uh, larger predators, you can add the fact that the, the hills are are constantly littered with uh, sheep from sheep dying on the mountain to afterbirth in lambing season to to uh, the ability to clean up uh, sheep nuts that have been spilt to um, predating uh, pheasants which are released for shooting into the landscape um, and all of these things are to added together I mean uh, as I said a fox population that's 20 times its natural density so you know, from my point of view, it's insane to be talking about, you know, how we how we treat the symptoms of the pro of the problem without directly looking at what's causing the problem itself, which is landscapes which are completely um, dysfunctional ecologically. <laughs> So after that little rant, I mean, you know, I don't want to keep talking. Uh, that would be that would be a rewilder's perspective on this, though, you know, which is that, you know, we really need to. I mean, I, mean, I think, you know, as a rewilder, I certainly am aware of the need for high nature value farming and the need to embrace the shooting community as well. Um, I mean, I think certainly, for example, around here where Sika deer are a massive problem, um, they're a non-native invasive species and their densities are incredibly high and that causes immense ecological problems. They, they graze out uh, native woodlands, causing them to, to disappear and all of the uh, related ground flora. So, you know, people around here who are, who are shooting Sika deer, they're providing a hugely valuable service um, and I th and I think I would certainly concur with the sentiments uh, expressed earlier that we need to be inclusive in our discussions rather than saying well I'm right and you're all wrong I think we need to to we all have things we can learn from each other but I would be unapologetic in arguing that from my own perspective, that we need to be moving towards uh, wilder ecosystems that uh, regulate themselves and function autonomously without the need for continual management by people. Um, and just to add um, to that, um, as a general principle, I would have issues with the idea of focusing con conservation on one species whether it's curlew or whatever else i think i think it's essential that we move away from thinking in those terms towards thinking in ecosystem terms um, because you know ecological collapse and biodiversity loss isn't just affecting it, it's affecting species across the board and we really need to be thinking of what we can do to reverse all of that rather than focusing on one species. So if anybody would like to ask me or anything, if, if, I mean, maybe I've said enough, but I'm not <laughs> sure. <laughs> that, that, that's fine, Owen. Thank you ever so much. That's a really good overview of, of your perspective. And I think your perspective of rewilding will chime with many people. Um, that uh, in, I suppose at one extreme, it's just let nature get on with it and we'll just withdraw and we've got have no right to sort of be in it and, and and manage it in any way. And then there's a whole I, list I of grey areas down that are not as extreme. I mean, I don't think rewilding is about people having no right to be in it or that people should be put out. I, I would absolutely dispute that. Right. Uh, and I think, and it's not, nor is it about walking away and just simply walking away and letting nature get on with it. I think we need to intervene to undo some of the effects of things, actions, human impacts in the past. So, for example, reintroducing lost species, uh, controlling exotic species until ecosystems are able to do that for themselves. Uh, it's not about walking away and it's not about 
you know, pushing people out either. I think rewilding has amazing potential to to re-engage rural communities and uh, society in general with our our landscapes and nature in general. Yeah, thanks. I completely understood. Um, I was just making the point that um, there are there is a whole range of meaning that people put to rewilding on the one extreme that it is the sort of keep people out and let nature do its thing. And then it goes down in, in shades of grey to a much more managed landscape, but managing it for biodiversity. And that's also been called rewilding. So as we've said before, it's quite a flexible plastic term. And I'd like to, uh, so thanks for that explanation. And um, and and just, just to give us a sense of the changes that you've seen in the land that you have rewilded. So when I came here, um, there was a forest that had developed over much of the farm through, um, through the fact that the farm hadn't been used. So it wasn't grazed for, as I later found out, around a century before I came. And that had allowed a, a wild native forest to develop naturally through uh, natural regeneration and self-seeding of the trees and all of the associated biodiversity. Um, now, unfortunately, for the last uh, 10 or 20 years before I came, that process had been completely uh, interrupted and blocked by the arrival of high numbers of feral goats and sika deer in the area, which was allowing um, invasive species, including rhododendron, but a whole host of others to start taking over. So I uh, applied for a grant to fence out the, the herbivores. And in the meantime, I started removing the rhododendron, etc. Um, and as a result, once the once the place was fenced uh, and between the, 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 the end to overgrazing and me getting rid of the, the invasive plant species, the whole place has absolutely exploded with life um, in, from naturally regenerating tree seedlings, uh, which have since turned into forest where there was previously just grass to um, other areas where I'm practicing more high nature value farming, where there's a, an amazing floral diversity and, and a huge influx of invertebrates and bird life and all the rest of it. So it's been really, really, it's been such a privilege to see all that happen. Okay, great, thank you. So I think we've got from the, the speakers that we've heard a real sense of the different um, the different uses of the uplands and the way that, that nature kind of fits into it, the way that we've got used to nature fitting into it. And I take Owen's point exactly that just to see everything through the eyes of one species distorts the big picture because just to see things through the eyes of, of curlews who don't particularly like trees because they have predators in them, could be seen as being a sort of anti-rewilding species, if you like. And maybe if Britain was much more rewilded, uh, there'd be far, far fewer curlews left. So there's all these big philosophical and, and sort of existential questions we have to ask ourselves based around what sort of country we want to live in and how much nature we want where. Uh, and so I would, I'm going to ask, first of all, uh, Lee, do you see yourself as a rewilder, given that you are adding nature to the Yorkshire Dales? Um, yeah, I mean, I agree that rewilding is an extremely elastic term. I think, I mean, we, the thing that I didn't mention is we actually have areas on the farm which are completely excluded from all of our grazing animals. So there are areas that are just completely fenced off. Um, and one field in particular that's quite wet that we do get curlews nesting in that we exclude animals altogether and it hasn't been grazed for probably 10 years. And an area next to that that hasn't been grazed for 15 years. And I actually think that's really, really important um, in the sense that we need lots and lots of micro habitats and mo a mosaic of different things to appeal to different species. Um, I think going forward, that might be something that we do slightly more of. We don't have a huge amount of trees in our area of the uplands. Our soil depth 
on limestone is pretty minimal. We get more scrub growing than, say, landscape trees. Um, and I think it would be good for us to trial out uh, more areas that have freedom um, where nature can completely express itself. And I think nature friendly farming or nature led farm, high nature value farming. I think the thing for us was putting the brakes on and slowing things down and taking all the pressure out. And that was the thing that we've really tried to do, I guess, and work within natural processes rather than against natural processes and carry the stock over winter. We can feed from our own grass up on the hills and not, you know, do the thing which we used to do, which was buy in feeds and feed stuff and have too many animals on the farm. So working within natural processes, I don't think that's necessarily a form of rewilding, but it's a mindset that has led us into areas of removed and restricted grazing, I would say. And the areas that we have where we have restricted grazing are amazing. You know, and do you think you'd still have curlews if you had a lot more of that land, Lee? I think we probably would because I just don't think the seed bank is still there for trees for us. I think if we I think we would get a little bit of natural regen, uh, but I don't think we'd get trees at scale. And I think if we want we've I've been really vocal about we have a very um, active tree planting environment group in our village and I've really, really uh been reticent to engage in any major tree planting or landscape scale trans uh, planting simply because I think for waders in this particular location where where I, where I feel the farm is very important to them I I don't know that it would be a positive thing for them at the moment um, but I think there's lots of ways of looking at the health of the farm in terms of the carbon that's been sequestered, all of those things. We don't know enough about that that yet to know that trees are the absolute thing. And trees are great for biodiversity. They're great for lots and lots of things. But I feel a lot of tree planting at scale is done at the minute to mitigate carbon outputs. And not enough of it is about nature led recovery. I, I feel sometimes nature gets lost in the climate recovery argument. Thank you, Lee. And uh, Matt, over to you for a comment on what you've heard from Owen and just from from Lee there. Um, would you see that shooting could be part of the rewilding process and still give us the benefits of the ground nesting birds? How do how do you see that? It's what they're almost in some ways they seem to be at odds with each other. But am I is that a confusing picture? No, I, I think. There, there are multiple axes of 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 difficulty in this. Um, I think that um, part part of the problem is that if you ever really want to um, get the get the gamekeeping and shooting community uh, against you, then talk about rewilding. Right? Okay? You know, and, and no offence to Owen at all. I'm, you know, but I, it is it is a very divisive term. Um, it, it, Oh, it's sorry, it's not a divisive term. It's a term that is going to turn a large section of that community radically off anything you're proposing. OK, um, so the, the terminology in itself is really important and we have to be careful about how we talk about these things. Um, I think the, to my mind, I think what we want in the uplands um, is a mixture of things. OK, and, and I want rewilding. In the uplands, I think that's an important part of of the future of of upland Britain, and I think it's something we should we should welcome um, and accept. and And I think we should accept that rewilding is a land use, and any land use has advantages and disadvantages. Okay, and there will be disadvantages um, as areas become rewilded. The, the kind of shooting that um, people probably think about normally, sort of large scale pheasant shooting or grouse shooting probably is not compatible with the type of, of rewilding um, that Owen is talking about. Um, other forms of shooting are, Owen, for example, talks about deer stalking, uh, feral goat control, those kind of things. Yeah, they probably are. Um, there are certainly other countries in the world that have that have very wild landscapes um, on which people hunt. There's, you know, those things are emphatically are compatible. Um, but 
I think the thing for me is that one thing doesn't need to exclude the other. Why can't you have a rewilded holding and next door to it a traditionally managed holding? The, the uplands doesn't have to all be one thing or the other thing. What we need to do is work out how we get along in these situations. And as somebody who lives in the uplands, um, I think my house is probably slightly below your, your height ceiling. But, you know, I think culturally, economically, no one would dispute that where I live is, is an upland area. Um, what I want is I want a, a diverse and economically um, diverse and a culturally diverse and, and a diverse landscape in the uplands because that's what makes our communities robust. OK, and I, I think rewilding is part of that in the same way that shooting is part of that. The kind of farming that Lee is talking about is, is absolutely part of that. Forestry is part of that. So I, I don't think we need to fight rewilding. Um, and the other thing I'd say is I think there is real wisdom and perception in the underlying philosophies of, of rewilding. Um, you know, I, I think that the rewilding movement has struck on something about about the kind of um, endless cycle of, of single species conservation and and have the, how there could be a different way of doing things. I think we have to acknowledge the wisdom and the perception that that idea has brought to us. And the other thing is that, that truly wild landscapes are wonderful. They are wonderful things. Um, about two weeks ago, I was I was in Estonia, the National Park in Estonia, with a beautiful, actually rewilded landscape, a landscape that one time was exploited commercially. That commercial exploitation has been dialed back and it's rewilded. What a wonderful place. Why wouldn't we want that? Um, but what we need to do is is work out how we all rub along, okay, and acknowledge the kind of value that different the different um, philosophies and different land uses bring, um, and work out how we we sort of sit next to each other and we don't try and chase each other out. Um, yeah, that's that's my take on rewilding. Is there's definite perception, there's definite wisdom there. Um, and it is definitely part of how I would like to see this area that I live in and which my family grew up in, how I would like to see it develop. It's part of it. Is it the complete solution? Do I want the, uh, the entirety of Britain's uplands rewilded? No, no, I don't. But it is part of, of how we can move forward. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much, Matt. Russ, this is a question that you and I have struggled with so much, isn't it? The, the, the management of the uplands and all these different ways farming to grow food, uh, the uplands as a, as a place for leisure and shooting, the uplands as a place to plant trees um, for sort of commercial forestry, all these different land uses that we've been hearing in and out about that. You and I have struggled with this quite a lot to know as the curlew, from a curlew perspective, how they fit into this and how curlews can be part of a richer future, but but we may have to say, actually, you know, we may have to have fewer of them in the future if we want a much more rewilded, if you like, landscape. Yeah, I mean, we're getting into the meat of a really interesting conversation now, which is, is great. Um, just to pick up on a couple of things. So there are national differences. So I think Matt picked up quite rightly, you know, the, the paper that was uh, presented by Natural England on, on future use of the uplands. Um, I mean, I personally raised an eyebrow when I read that paper, and I know very well that Patrick Laurie and others just the other side of the, the board would have a very different perspective on the world. So there are differences in terms of policy and perspective in different nations, even in different regions. And I think one of the key things I want to get across here is there's a difference in time scale. You know, curlews across much of this country are on life support. You know, we are clinging on to them and we're talking about extinction across Ireland, Wales and lowland southern England in the next couple of decades based on current trends. So uh, we don't have time to do experiments. We need to do things that are going to be um, effective very quickly. And at the moment, the two things that we need to do are compensate farmers to change cutting regimes in grassland environments. And we need to uh, deal with the issue of uh, very large numbers of mesa predators, whatever the drivers of those large numbers are. So there's a sort of short term issue. I think someone mentioned why focus on a single species. Well, when we're dealing with something like a silage landscape, silage dominated landscape, you know, James Phillips, who's who's you know very senior now in Natural England, uh, used the phrase that you know silage fields are, are effectively a sink for much of nature, and and you know I think it's quite hard to argue with that in terms of silage fields where you've got cutting multiple times a year. It's not just curlews that are affected by that. 
that other ground nesting birds, mammals, invertebrates, and even flora are impacted by it. So you've effectively got a, a rather biodiversity poor um, landscape. So having something like a curlew as a totemic species that has cultural significance as well as scientific and, and just data significance is really important to try and get across some short term actions in terms of policy and agri environment schemes, which are very dull. But the only way we're going to turn it around for nature at the scale that's required across much of this country is going to be around agri environment policy. Um, and so it just gives us a hook to hang things off. It's quite hard to hang it off of a habitat or an invertebrate that no one's ever heard of, whereas curlew has real significance across the country. And then in terms of the question that Mary's really posed, which is you know, from a CRP perspective, how many curlews would we accept in this country in 10, 50, 100 years? And that is a discussion that from a CRP perspective, we haven't really had yet. We are going to have a, a round table in January to start talking about this issue because it's very pertinent to the one around forestry. Yeah, if we if we meet our tree planting targets, we will have less curlews. That is inevitable. We'll have less breeding waders. There is going to be some impact on breeding waders, even if that tree planting is done as sensitively as possible. It's just inevitable that there will be an impact. We've got to remember that we only have, I think, 10 to 15 percent woodland cover uh, in the UK at the minute. If we go back to the period where human intervention was least and the climate was most similar to what it is now, albeit changing, that was towards the uh, latter stages of the last ice age and the start of the current sort of Holocene period a few thousand years ago. You know, current science suggests we have had a lot more tree cover. Pretty much all of the lowlands would have been covered in forest and, and much of the uplands as well. So if we're talking about true rewilding, that is the climax vegetation that a lot of this country would have been in before human intervention at a significant level. So if we want to get back to that, then most of the country would be covered in trees and we'd have hardly any breeding waders or other ground nesting birds. That's not realistic, but that's that's the sort of end member that we've got to think about. Uh, and at the moment we've got tree planting targets which are very incrementally going to be getting us back towards that sort of level of, of woodland cover. And then it comes back to this interplay. There's a thing in the comments that if you have a rewilded landscape, it's going to take time to get back the balance of predators. And at the moment, we've got an abundance and overabundance of meso predators and not many, not many, not enough of the apex predators. And that's not going to come along quickly. That's going to potentially take decades to get that balance back. And in the meantime, we just don't have decades for species like like curlew. So I think that time scale, there's a short term putting in the sticking plasters just to keep things like curlew across large swathes of the country uh, and using it as a totem for other species in what is dominantly managed landscape. And then there's a long term aspiration, which is do we want to get back to a much higher percentage of woodland cover in this in this country? Thank you. That's um, so there's a short, medium and long term perspective on all of this, which is why <clears throat> our discussion is um, we've barely touched the surface this evening. Obviously, all we've managed to do with the speakers is just give specific uh, it is to give a flavour of the complexity of what we're facing. Owen, we can't see you, so uh, you kind of in the background there. Do you want to come back on anything anyone said? Well, again, I mean, I you know, there's just there'd be so much to say. Uh, really interesting points from everybody who spoke. Um, I mean, I'd wholeheartedly agree with the idea that you know rewilding for a start um it it shouldn't i i don't feel it should be imposed on anybody i mean certainly within an irish context i think it's really important to, to get across the idea that that uh, it should be a choice that's given to to farmers or other landowners rather than uh, anything that's imposed on people and i think the way that we can do that is by changing the um the farm subsidies uh, criteria to allow rewilding become an option for being paid uh, to continue to be paid farm pa payments without without farming land. Uh, but as I say, uh, emphasizing the word option, uh, I think it's really important that it's just that it's something that's available to to people rather than forced on them. Um, I mean, I live I live in a rural uh, la uh, community myself, and I totally agree that you know what what we should be looking at here is a whole diversity of approaches uh, that include high nature value farming. Um, I'm, you know, I, I think I think um, 
you know, one of the really common misconceptions uh, maybe um, that, that Russ kind of touched on there is the idea that rewilding is about going back to some kind of a previous state. Uh, it's really not about that. It's, it's about going forward to um, a, a, a new situation in which nature, uh, in which people take the breaks off nature once again. And allow it, and allow natural processes to start playing out uh, without being compromised by by uh, human activities. So, the idea that rewilding means just going back to a, an almost totally wooded landscape isn't true. It means it means going forward to all sorts of different types of habitats. Uh, and and I think it's worth asking ourselves here, um, you know how did curlew survive before people came along? Like, I'm, I'm sure that if you go back to the Eemian, the last um, um, interglacial period, I'm sure there were plenty of curlews in Britain and Ireland, uh, and, but there were no people to, to kind of shoot foxes or, or kind of graze habitats to exactly the right level or anything else. But the curlews got on probably far better than they are now. So these are the kind of questions that we need to be asking ourselves. We need to be saying, okay, is it, you know, how do we change the whole paradigm here so that not just curlews, but but all of the the many many thousands of other species that we're losing, uh, that we're hemorrhaging, that they they start that 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 populations start to to stabilize and that ecosystems start to become healthy and functional again. Yep. But as, as I've that. said, in a way, in a way that doesn't that's not that doesn't exclude anybody or make people feel feel pushed out. It needs it needs to be all happen in a very inclusive way, I think. Yeah, that's that's exactly right. So we've had a, a sense that the uplands have to, this is where rewilding is really focusing in the uplands at the moment. It's where we want to put plantations so we get wood. It's where we want to grow some food. It's where we want to put our renewable energy. It's actually talked about as where we want to introduce a lot of the species that, that have been um, driven out of this country some many centuries ago, like wink, lynx and wildcats. The, the uplands are this great big space that, that feel big but are not because they have so many uses and so many people wanting a piece of the pie. And I think if hopefully anything has come across tonight is just how complicated it is, but just how possible it is if we kind of put um, preconceptions aside and put divisions aside and say, what kind of Britain do we want to live in and how do we work together to get the most nature considering all the things that we have we expect from the land. Um, I think that's a really useful sense to, to take away with us tonight. It's just what we're up against here. And it's things that Russ and I discuss all the time and all the people in the Curlew Recovery Partnership and in Curlew Action, we think about these issues and how do we go forward? Because unless we take everybody with us, unless everybody agrees that we want to go forward with a richer future, there will be so many blockages on the way, it will slow us down. And so just to put differences aside and just focus on what binds us together, to me, is the most important thing. I think what we have to do now in the last quarter of an hour is go over to Roger, who has been compiling some amazingly good and interesting questions in the chat. Roger, have you got, can you start firing away? I, I can, absolutely. Actually, I was just thinking this very good old Persian um, expression, which is there is a field beyond right and wrong, meet me there. Um, and I think this evening's thing is rather, um, is rather sort of head in that direction. It's run, um, something that was raised right at the beginning with between Lee and Mary, which I think might be worth having a little look at, is the cultural aspects of the land management. And I think we talked a lot about rewilding and a lot about shooting and things. And maybe it's important not to let that one get lost. So Mary, perhaps we could just have a little more talk about that. Yes, are there any specific questions about that, uh, Roger, in the in the chat, do you think? Well, it was it was really more that you and Lee were kind of raising it as uh, as an issue that, that there are humans who live up here and, that, and 
that has to be part of the whole thing. Yeah, I just thought and, it was some, maybe something that you and Lee could dis have. A yes, quick absolutely. Discussion. And 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 people as part of the landscape in terms of making a living up there, like Lee's talking, and having sport and recreation up there. And one of those is shooting, which matters. To come up. very quick comments from both of you on that. Lee, do you want to kick off? Yeah, I mean, I the as an outsider to the deals, really, I I didn't, I'd never really experienced culture quite like it, and I think. For upland farmers, the cultural attachment to sheep and sheep breeding, for example, and being a farmer in the uplands is enormous. And Neil has gone through machinations of machinations of reducing sheep numbers. And even though he knew it was the right thing to do, it was still a, a difficult process for him mentally to give up sheep and to reduce their numbers for me it was very easy because it it no it didn't really make any sense to me for all the reasons i described but for him it was a real cultural thing about how he was perceived by other farmers in his community um his pride in having big numbers of sheep who were all fit and well and off the hill that sort of thing and i think you can't underestimate the culture of the uplands and how much that impresses upon people's business lives even though the business didn't make financial sense with that many sheep numbers and that we made more money, could make more money out of less sheep because of the level of input we were putting into them, he still struggled to move on from that. And we did, and he did, but it wasn't easy. And I think breaking down some of the reasons why people stay in those systems is that they are mentally physically and emotionally culturally tied to them and i think when we're talking about moving into say nature led on it high nature value farming i think that's a big thing that i noticed that and i i can't speak for all upland farmers at all but it's one of the things i really noticed as an outsider um and when i think the, the culture of farming in the dales i think a lot about those things and we're talking about generations of hill sheep that go back for hundreds and hundreds of years and the pride in going to the auction and selling those sheep or buying those sheep or being perceived by your peers as well so i don't know whether that's relevant but i feel that's something i've really really noted over the years um and actually us coming out of that system into something very different um other people probably struggled with it in terms of what why we were doing it why how could we possibly think of selling all these sheep and you know it, it really raised a few eyebrows and yeah i think culture is really really important yeah thank you Lee. um matt the culture yeah. of the uplands in terms of the shooting community yeah well first what, I, what i'd say is to, to add to what lee said so actually when i was a little boy my dad was a shepherd so I, I started my life on sheep farms. Um, my best friend is a hill sheep farmer in Northumberland. Lots of other friends who are, who are sheep farmers and I absolutely recognise what Lee is saying. And I think one of the one of the failings in the conservation community has to be to fail to really identify with that culture, right? It's been to fail to try and understand the value system that underlies that culture, um, and and. I think it's been a real problem with rewilding as well, is that it's been going in with the assumption that this is defective and wrong and, and instead of trying to engage with it and, and grasp that culture. So absolutely, I think the cultural element of the uplands is absolutely fundamental. The other thing I'd add on that is that particularly on what we might call the Celtic fringe. So in, in, in Wales and in the northwest of Scotland, where you have a really strong link between land a language and cultural identity and those things are immensely strongly linked um and in the west it's called the you know in the west highlands linked by a really sort of brutal and tragic history you can't ignore those things when you're talking about conservation and actually they, they all play into this discussion about curlews because it's about it, it reflects in the values in how people manage their land okay and that's that's an you know that's four hours in itself so i'm not going to go into that but you have to engage with these things as complex cultural systems that are inhabited by people who have a set of values um, and if if you can do that then you you'll get somewhere i think yeah thanks matt 
Um, Owen, just a, a few sentences from you on that, and then we'll move on to some of the questions, more questions. Yeah, I wholeheartedly agree with everything that's been said. That's my experience as well here in the Bear Peninsula in Southwest Ireland, is that things, the, the, the culture of um, livestock and sheep and all the rest of it is hugely important. Um, but I and I think I think that needs to be understood by people who who want to to who want to reverse the the collapse of nature and biodiversity. Um, it needs to be understood and respected, but we still need to stand up for nature because we're losing nature at a rate of knots. And um, and the last thing I'd say on that is you know uh, uh, you know, sometimes our perceptions of these things can be actually not completely rooted in 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 reality. So, for example, you know, uh, if if rewilding is seen as big coming in and and pushing out cultural traditions like sheep, if you actually go back into into it, uh, for example, the, the the clearances up in Scotland were were to make way for sheep. So it's actually not a case of, you know, it, it's not as simple as it can often seem. I would agree with that. So, uh, yeah, I would totally agree with that. And I would also say that culture by its very nature does change. And in our situation, in a Neil situation, his his perception of his own Dale's culture has changed. And now he sees himself, I think, very much as a keeper of the land. He still has pride in the hundred breed and swill ewes that we have, in the belted Galloway cattle, in the fact that the farm thrives and that nature thrives and that there's opportunities for him to be able to achieve more in his lifetime. And I think it's not insurmountable. It, you, it can break, you can break it down, but it, it is a recognition of that is how it is. It, I think is important, as, okay. as Owen said. From, a, from the Curly Action and Curly Recovery Partnership point of view, I mean that the culture of how curlews weave their way into landscapes and music and language and traditions is really, really important part of, of selling um, the sort of conservation value of species to people uh, because it's, it's very important to touch people's hearts and minds as well as the sort of intellectual and the, the sort of scientific approach to bringing back nature. People have got to love it as well. And so um, in defense of, of single species conservation, from that point of view, having some, as, as Russ keeps saying, having something to hang your hat on helps you to do that emotional engagement and touch that cultural side of nature, which is such a big, such a big driver of our behaviour right across the board. Um, Eddie, so Roger, some, can you pick out some of the questions from the chat? I think we, yeah, if we've got time for one more, maybe two more. Um, maybe two more, yeah. Two uh, well, the it's big probably, one, probably one for Russ, this, but um, how does agroforestry and hedges and shelter belts um, fit in with wider conservation in uplands? That seemed one interesting one. Yeah, good question. I mean, the science in this country suggests not very well, uh, because generally, even within 500 to 1000 metres away from any kind of, of wooded area, the breeding success of breeding waders goes down dramatically. So there's, there's you know, pretty good science to underpin that. But that's why I put up that photo at the start of showing Finland and the landscape where we've probably got the biggest and highest density area of curlews left in the world, Eurasian curlews at least. Yeah, it's a very heterogeneous, very wooded landscape. Uh, and, and so then it comes down to what the predator guild is there. So it's not just about trees. It's about the interplay of trees, predators, the wider ecosystem, and then the ground nesting birds, particularly the breeding waders that, that sit within it. So at the moment in the current situation where we are, then anything, trees, any kind of cover for predators is bad because predation is probably the number one block on productivity on curlew and other breeding waders. That's not to say that won't always be the case in a more functional ecosystem, but that's where we are in this country right now. But that's different if you go to somewhere like Finland, which has also got good numbers of Eurasian curlew. Thank you. Um, one more. Mm -hmm. um, sure. the, the, there was one that you reacted to, Mary, which I just thought would be quite interesting to um, un unpick this answer a bit. Um, someone asked, um, how much could we rewild if we wanted to? 5%, 10%, 20%, and you were, you, you put the figure out there. Maybe it's just quite interesting to say where that research came from. 
Yes. So, uh, yeah, there was a bit of a chat. I think it was Steve Carver in the in the chat. And I um, when I talked to Alistair Driver or when Russ and I talked to Alistair Driver, he was saying that they're looking for around about five to 10 percent of rewilded land in terms of minimal impact, uh, minimal management, but much wider, broad broader landscape than that where management is definitely part of it, it was that sort of figure I think but um, Owen do you have any comment on on how much you think we can stand given that we have to grow food and do everything else as well? Well I, I what I'd say is that E.O. Wilson the, the famous biologist who sadly passed away at the end of last year estimated that we need to give around at least 50% of the planet, that's land and seas, over to wild nature, i.e. rewilding, if we are to save 85, around 85% of existing species that we have left on planet Earth. So that, even if we do that, even if we can manage somehow to rewild 50% of the planet, we're still going to lose 15% of what we have left. So that should be our, I think that should be our target. Now, I'm not saying that I think that that should happen next week or next year. I think that that should be uh, a target that we have uh, over the coming decades. And I think that it shouldn't be forced on anybody to repeat what I said early, earlier. I think it needs to happen in a way that's fair that people, that rural communities and farmers, uh, that, that they buy into it rather than feeling that it's imposed on them. So we have to find ways of making it uh, attractive and financially feasible for farmers and other rural lo landowners and rural communities in general. Right, thank you. Matt, you want to come in on that for a comment? I, yeah, I, I, so I, I suppose, I. I who has the right to say? That's the question, isn't it? Who has the right to say how much of Britain or how much of the uplands we should rewild? Um, you know, what, what authorises Professor Driver to make that decision? Um, I, I think it's a conversation we need to have, but I'm, I'm very reluctant, very resistant to have anybody come along and say, we're going to rewild this much of where you live, so that's going to happen, mate. Um, you know, that's 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 a tone that I find very difficult to accept. I think if you want to know how much of, of the Yorkshire Dales you should rewild, we'll have a chat with Lee. OK, you know, you, you need to start with the people who are there rather than starting by saying it's going to be, you know, 5 percent of this or 6 percent of that. I think it's the wrong approach. Well, we are out of time and we're very good at finishing on time it's now eight o'clock and um, I feel we've only just started to bring to the surface some of the most interesting issues in conservation actually at the moment uh, it's all about these big concepts that we all want a richer wilder world but what does that actually mean for people who live and work on the land and all the demands that you know us city dwelling types that's me put on the system we want this we want that we live in a, in a resource a demanding heavy country and we expect the land to give us everything. And I think we've just about introduced some of the major issues that we are facing today. Uh, it's why working on curly conservation is so fascinating because although it does seem to be like a single species, it isn't about a single species, it's about everything. Curlies make you think about everything. And um, and just that discussion that we've had this evening from really fantastic speakers. Thank you so much for bringing it all to the fore. There's um, a bit of chat going on in the chat, um, toing and froing, but particularly about grouse shooting. Um, but that's not at all surprising. And I think it's a topic that we should bite the bullet and come back to uh, in more detail later on. But for now, thank you to, to Lee Hessel Time for giving us a glimpse of what it's like to try and be a nature farmer in the uplands of Yorkshire. Thanks to Matt Cross for um, giving us your perspective on what it is uh, from the shooting point of view, how the uplands are really important and the work that the shooting community does in, in keeping predator numbers low and allowing ground nesting birds to thrive. Um, Thank you to Owen. I'm so sorry we can't see you, Owen. I hope you feel you've had enough time to speak um, and for your, 
your take on what rewilding is and, and how important it is that we we speak out for nature. You you put that very beautifully, I think, in the last thing you said, somebody's got to speak out for nature. And I think people like you and what you're doing on your farm and what Lee's doing on her farm are very definitely doing that. Yeah. And also, once again, thanks to Russ for standing in for Sam, who's not very well, but also for giving us such a great overview of the importance of uplands for curling. I hope you feel like that's been an interesting yeah. discussion and giving you enough to think about. Please um, look at our past webinars. We've covered, as we said, forestry in more detail. We've covered predator control in a bit more detail. Um, and uh, there are other topics going to be coming up. We're going to try and do one every month or two months. Um, we'll try and go do a full sweep of what the big issues are and then start to drill down a bit more into some of these issues in later webinars. Thank you for joining us tonight. We've had a very good turnout tonight. Please consider donating to Curlew Action. We need your dosh to keep going, so thank you. And once again, everybody, we really appreciate you contributing to us tonight. Thanks very much. Bye-bye. Thanks, Thank folks. Bye-bye.